we'll be taking a bit of a, a shift in perspective now from the Victorian perspective to a, a whole of Australia perspective as we talk about the, the market capacity challenges facing the infrastructure industry. So by market capacity, we mean the workforce, leadership skills and materials uh, needed for the infrastructure sector to, to deliver its projects. So again, uh, you can put questions through on, on, on the app uh, and, and uh, join for this discussion. Uh, we have a lot of expertise in infrastructure and project management. So I'm joined by the head of the School of Project Management at the University of Sydney, Professor uh, Jennifer White, uh, by the Interim Chair of Infrastructure Australia, Gabrielle Trainer, uh, and also the Chief Operating Officer for CPB Contractors, uh, Don Johnson. So the capacity of the market to deliver the, the infrastructure that, that Australia needs is an important issue as the, the sector is squeezed uh, between skill shortages and uh, supply chain constraints on the one hand and demand for, for substantial amounts of, of new infrastructure as we've, as we've heard from the, the state and, and federal ministers this morning. So, so Infrastructure Australia set out the scale of the challenge with its market capacity report released uh, late last year. Uh, and so I'll, I'll start with a question for you, Gabrielle. So given the scale of market capacity challenges uh, identified in, in that report, are we, uh, are we doing too much in terms of new infrastructure? And do we have the right priorities in terms of what we are doing? Yeah, thanks, um, thanks, Andrew. Before I answer that, can I also just um, congratulate Uncle Shane on a fantastic welcome, welcome to country and also declare, of course, that I'm um, hoping that, uh, that The Voice succeeds at the referendum and encourage everybody to talk about it very loudly at their workplaces, loudly, but um, in a very reasonable way. Um, so, um, of course, uh, I think the infrastructure industry has faced a perfect storm over the past few years, I think we all know that. Uh, a storm that's probably been brewing for, for quite a while. Um, not only on the, on the demand side, um, I think the pipeline, as our market capacity report uh, set out, um, is something like $247 billion worth of projects across, across the country. Uh, it's increased by $15 billion in the, uh, just in the last year. Uh, uh, at the, at the same time, we're facing extraordinary skill shortages on the supply side. Um, I think the Minister's number of 112,000 is in fact, if you look at the whole infrastructure picture, including smaller projects, it's something like 214,000 shortfall in, in uh, labour positions for infrastructure construction, which is just a mind-blowing number, isn't it? And that's going to increase this year, according to our report, um, a very good read, I might add, uh, by 42,000. So where do we get these people? Um, certainly, um, materials has been an enormous problem as well. We all know that, uh, particularly exacerbated by, by COVID. Uh, it looks as though there are some signs that um, material costs are moderating slightly. Uh, I think the price rises were about 24% last year. Uh, but uh, the, the signs are that freight and shipping costs, for instance, are back to pre-pandemic levels, but um, still delays, delays in, in procuring, procuring materials are probably now pretty well entrenched in the system. So that's yet another stress um, on, on the market. And the difficult thing uh, for the market, for the infrastructure industry, is that uh, we know construction companies need to change. They need to become more productive. They need to become more innovative. They need to become more diverse to attract more, more people. But when they're under such stress, um, I think, again, drawing from our report, uh, most of the firms surveyed said that they're up to 90% capacity and beyond. When industry is under such stress, it certainly means that you can't change. It's just too difficult to change. There's no capacity to even think about changing. So the problems become more entrenched. But looking at the uh, distribution, uh, looking at um, how we allocate projects and looking at government's uh, priorities now, as the minister said, we do need 
uh, and I think all the jurisdictions are very alive to this, to be smoothing the pipeline. That is one thing that can be done, and that's a, a, a relatively short-term exercise that governments, painful though it is, are presently undergoing. I think the federal government now has deferred something over six billion dollars worth of worth of projects, and it's happening in every in every jurisdiction. Um, to actually say to communities that no, um, uh, unfortunately, while this project has has merit, uh, we're just not in a position to to fund it, uh, is a very difficult thing. But um, we've just got to get responsible and get real, and governments are about the capacity to deliver these things. Otherwise, we're just going to continue this spiral where costs escalate. Uh, Labor costs went up 17% last year in the industry. That's going to continue, and it just makes it much harder for taxpayers to get value for infrastructure, and also, of course, delays and, and, and cost blowouts just become uh, a matter of course. So it is, uh, it's an acute problem, uh, but I know that governments are beginning to, um, to address this very seriously. Thanks a lot, Gabrielle. That gives us a lot to, to uh, dig further into. And, and, and one thing that you, you mentioned, which is obviously critical, was around the, the labour shortages. And, and the minister also mentioned that earlier. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this, Don, in terms of we have these big labour shortages. Are they getting worse from your perspective? And, and what can we do to, to resolve that challenge? Well, look, certainly there's, there's areas of the industry that are, uh, you know, there are shortages. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk white collar, blue collar. I think in white collar, yeah, we're generally getting the numbers that we need onto projects. What's sometimes lacking is the experience of those people coming onto the projects because the, the scale of the projects has escalated remarkably in, in recent years. So yeah, that, that really brings us to a, uh, a challenge of training people, bringing them up to speed. And construction's an industry where a bit of grey hair is pretty useful. Yeah, you've seen things before. So younger people we can train in the academic part of it, but to see things, that takes a bit longer. In blue collar, um, look, it, it's, it's patchy. I think what we've seen is you know, the disparity in wage rates that come in industry. We've probably attracted a lot of people out of the domestic industry into construction, which is putting further, further challenges on the domestic area. But depending on the projects in the area, you know, we probably see most stress in the in the trades, the mechanical, electrical type trades. When we're you know, we're getting into public transport jobs and a lot of commissioning work, you know, they're in very short supply. We compete with oil and gas for those resources. Um, but you know, things as basic as steel fixes, um, you know, there's shortages in particular areas on those. So what do we do about it? Um, I think there's a, a few areas. So training is one, and you know, as leaders in the industry you know, and other construction companies, we want to work with government to, to address that challenge. So you know, there's numerous ways of doing that. And as I said before, you know, when we look at the experience that, that people have, we've got to find quick ways of addressing that. So you know, one of the examples of that in, uh, in New South Wales, we've joined forces as CPB, with TAFE and with the uh, Western Sydney Uni, and we're developing what's called the Institute of Applied Technology Construction. Now that's aimed to develop, to deliver micro-credentials, micro-skills, so short-term training to get people up to, to speed. We've identified where the real skills shortages are in the industry, and there's no reason we can't roll out that model further around Australia. Now it's in its infancy in, uh, in New South Wales, we've got to get it running, but you know, enrolments have opened and there's been a couple of thousand applications in the space of a week to, to do that. So I think that shows the sort of demand that's, uh, that's out there. Um, we've, we can also look you know, forward with the pipeline. Um, there's a lot of regional work coming up. You know, we've really seen a concentration in metropolitan areas over recent years, but regional work, particularly when it comes to renewable energy, we're seeing a very large pipeline. Now, frankly, the workforce isn't in the regional areas at the moment. So how are we going to address that? And you know, we're already bringing in uh, you know, people on visas from overseas, but I think there's an opportunity to look harder at you know, making visas and immigration into regional areas easier and more attractive to uh, attract the workforce into those areas. 
Um, and it's not just a case of reskilling people. I mean, in Dubbo in New South Wales, I mean, you know, there is you know, literally billions of dollars of work to be done out there, and you know, unemployment in Dubbo is next to nothing. So it's not just a case of reskilling people. We need to bring people into the area with the right skills. Um, the third area is making uh, you know, the work, the the construction workforce, more attractive for a broader, diverse workforce. We need more women. Yeah, you know, we're missing a huge opportunity here. Um, yeah, I think you know, overall figures might be 12%. Exemplar projects might be you know, running 25 to 30% women on jobs. But what we do lack in those numbers is women actually doing the work. Yeah, you know, we, we, we're uh, yeah, we've got a lot of women in uh, environmental roles. We're getting women into management roles, but we've got far fewer women in supervisory roles and the trade roles on the jobs. So, you know, if we're going to get you know, true diversity on jobs, we've really got to focus on that. Um, yeah, a woman coming in to be a supervisor, supervising 20 guys in the industry that we have at the moment isn't a particularly attractive proposition. So we need, to, we need to change the culture. We need to get parents talking to their kids that it's OK to come into this construction because the culture is OK. Um, yeah, one of the things that you know, we're doing, we have a, a, a women in trades program that uh, has been very successful in Sydney, and we're looking to roll that around, out around Australia. Yeah, we've we just advertised. We got 20 new starters, never worked in construction before put them through three, pe three weeks of paid training and allocated them to our projects. And they're all going through civil, uh, you know, certificates in civil construction. All right, so we'll have another two cohorts this year. And if we can get that momentum and you know, others are doing you know, same things, we can get that, that drive to create more women across the board, which is going to be very useful. Okay. Thanks a lot, Don. That point's very well taken. I think with, if, if there's, there's a strong academic literature that if you're the only person, the only woman or the only person from a group, it's, it's very difficult. So it's a matter of mm. pushing past those, those barriers. Mm. I'm glad that you raised that mm. important topic and, and also the energy transition and the regional and skills aspects of, of that, which is something CEDA will be doing work on this year and, and we have a, a breakout session on that later today. So. Mm. It's, I'm really glad to hear you, you raised those issues in, in what's clearly a challenging topic. Um, shifting now a bit to, to more how we do uh, projects. So um, is there a possibility of freeing up capacity by um, better restructuring how we structure project delivery and make governance more, more fit for purpose. Uh, we will have a session on, on partnerships later and we heard about that came strongly out of last year's conference. Uh, so, so maybe touch on that, but we'll speak about that more later. But I'd be very uh, keen to hear your views, Professor White, and, and drawing from your UK experience as well. Thank you. So um, at the John Grill Institute for Project Leadership, uh, we were set up to transform uh, project leadership in Australia. And, and really project leadership is a challenge because we, we're facing uh, ch a ch changing technological landscape, different organisational structures, and, um, increased understanding about stakeholders and also a changing environment. And yet our project structures are really set up for business as usual, routine projects. And projects the, the kind of projects that Australia is building today are um, no longer you know, greenfield roads, they're, they're, they're urban projects with increasing amounts of complexity. And that requires different kinds of thinking, a mindset shift in terms of how you set up and deliver projects. Um, I have, I, I, you know, I come from the UK, so I was on the main board of, of construction leadership Council in the UK, they're having very similar conversations about skills. Australia is not the only place that faces these kinds of skill shortages, um, but, but um, uh, you know, and, and that means that it's operating in a very competitive global landscape for skills. So, 
um, yes, yes, it needs to create sovereign uh, uh, capacity. Um, yes, it, it, it probably does need to import some skills to, to deal with short-term challenges, but that's, that's a competitive landscape because every other country that, that, you know, if you talk about Europe, if you talk about the US, they're also um, facing these kinds of skill shortages. And, um, you know, I would really argue that, 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 that some of the, the challenges that we face are really complex and uncertain and they require mindset shifts from government and from project leaders and, you know, if we're going to move um, from being a kind of lowest cost adversarial industry to being a technology led collaborative industry that requires a different relationship with the research base. And so there's a real opportunity to bring, um, to bring universities, industry and government together to address some of these challenges. Great, thanks. There's a question here from, from the floor, which is, uh, has a lot of interest, which is around, uh, again, coming back to skill shortages and, and how are projects responding to, to quality issues in the context of labour shortages where, where you have more inexperienced staff than you might like? Uh, and, and this also is, I guess, an, an opportunity to bring you in, Gabrielle, on, on, the, on the skill side of things whether there's things happening that you think are valuable or, or things that need to happen, we'll start with you, it'd be great. Uh, it is you know, a, a really live issue on sites everywhere, but um, if you can get people to come in at entry level, they need a, you know, really significant experience to guide them and supervise them. Um, I don't know that anyone's really got the, got the answers apart from making sure that their processes and systems and their wise heads that you spoke about, Don, the grey hair people, are there to, to really, um, you know, be extremely vigilant and nurturing of, of young people on sites. Um, I was at a site just a couple of weeks ago um, that uh, it was obvious that the attention to detail of the, of the, uh, on, at, at the finishing of the project just hadn't been there because, you know, it's like hospitality at the moment too. Um, we just haven't got the people with the with the experience and the, and the skills to actually know. They don't know what they don't know. To, 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 it's it's it is a real problem. Um, I think things like the initiatives that you're talking about, Don, with micro credentials, um, things like uh, uh, all the emphasis that's being placed on skills and getting more apprentices into the system with a bit of background is going to be um, a longer term solution. But in the short term, it, it, it really is very difficult and it's facing, um, it's facing everyone in the construction industry at all, at all levels. But good processes, good systems and, and good, good supervision um, is probably about the only routine sort of answer that you, can, um, that you can apply to this problem at the moment. Look, I, I might just jump in too. I mean, you know, so much of this is about training. And you know, we've we just got an obligation to, to invest. I mean, I always go back to the, you know, the, the quote from Henry Ford, where he, he said, the, the, only worse, the only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. Right? <laughs> so you know, I, I think we've got to be guided by that. You know? So um, on projects, what do we do? You know, we, we try to set up teams around a core, you know, a core of experience and bring newcomers in to learn off that core. Now that becomes harder as uh, you know, the industry is more stretched. But unless you do that, if you just have a, a team of newbies, you're going to get those quality problems that are discussed. Um, but training our people, as I said before, some of the initiatives, and they're, they're more I initiatives for the industry. But you know, on our projects, I mean, our large projects, North East Link in, uh, in Melbourne, Westgate, West Connexes in, in Sydney, they've all got training academies attached to them. You know, and we expand the induction program for everyone coming through there. Wherever possible, we put people under a certificate in civil construction. We train them in the basics of doing the jobs. And we, we've trained tens of thousands of people with our joint venture partners. Now, in addition to that, um, uh, what we've got to do, you know, I just lost my train of thought with, with where I was going with that. Um, we're, we're looking at our engineers as well, right? So, you know, we're, most 
engineers that come out of uni are very well trained technically, but there's a lot more to make them adapted to the construction industry. You know, I mean, people skills for once, you, you don't get a lot of that in engineering school, but you need that to, to lead people on projects. Um, you know, so I think most of the big contractors are putting their teams through appropriate training programs. I know in, in CPB, you know, we've got about 1,200 site engineers, project engineers across the company. We're putting every one of those engineers through eight days of training across seven modules this year to bring them up to speed on things like quality, commercial, you know, design, and, and importantly, in, you know, going forward, uh, digital, which is where the industry is going. So it just doesn't happen by osmosis on jobs. You get a bit of that, but you've got to force the issue by uh, actually getting out there and training people. When I studied engineering, we, we had to do introduction to engineering management, and we used to joke that that was about teaching us to be like normal human beings. So, <laughs> so what you say rings true. Um, just, just while we're talking about engineers, there's a, a question from the floor, and it comes back to the gender diversity point you raised earlier, Don, uh, that, that less than 16% of, of graduates in engineering are, are female. Um, so sort of going back when, when people are younger, earlier on through the educational uh, process. Uh, are you seeing initiatives out there to, to address that or, or, or should, should more be done there? I'll start with you, Don, and then others. Oh, de definitely more needs to be done. You know, as I said, I think part of it goes to the perceived culture in the industry. And it may not just be perceived, some of it is actually the culture. Um, you know, there, there's probably um, easier work sites or workplaces for, for women to work. And we need to change that. And I know that you know some of the things you see on projects just shouldn't be and are not tolerated in this day and age. And and we've uh, we've removed some people off jobs for making the the workplace uncomfortable for women to, to work. Yeah. So that that's part of it. That 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 cultural piece. You know, to, to change it, but then you've got to get in. And I mean, I've heard comments recently. There's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of people working in schools to you know year nine to twelve to try and demonstrate that uh, you know there are fulfilling careers for women in construction. And oftentimes it's the the parents that we've got to get through. Oftentimes it's the career officers in in the schools that are saying why would you why would you want to go and be an electrical apprentice. I mean, that, that's not a, you know, a job for a woman. So we've got to break down those barriers because we need to help make young people make their own decisions about where they want to go and not have these prejudices uh, put upon them. Can I just um, put on my hat um, as the chair of a thing called the Construction Industry Culture Task Force, uh, which is, I think we're four years into a two-year project as you know, Tim, um, <laughs> Tim Reardon was one of the people at the at the very forefront of this. It's a collaboration uh, between Victoria and, and New South Wales governments and uh, the ACA. And we have, um, you'll be pleased to know, Jennifer, a team of academics, workplace academics working with us. And what we've tried to focus on is this, this point of culture in the workplace in the construction industry. We know that there are probably three interrelated um, issues in the industry to do with commerciality and contracting, to do with capability and, and capacity, and that goes to the point of you know, trying to encourage young people into the industry from an early age. Uh, but the culture of the industry we're focused on is a, is a discrete item um, under the auspices of a thing called the Construction Industry Leadership Forum. And what we've done is over the past couple of years develop um, what we're calling a culture standard. There have been enormous um, efforts over many, many years uh, to, focusing on things like gender diversity. You have Nawik who's been working on that for 25 years. You've had people working very hard on mental health and wellbeing in the industry, mates in construction, in Co-Link, many, many initiatives across, across those two domains. Uh, but nothing has really changed. Nothing has really moved the needle. Women who come into the industry through programs like um, you know, um, the um, skills training uh, uh, initiatives in New South Wales, for instance, uh, they find an industry that's unfriendly to them. I know the, um, the ETU did a, 
a interesting study last year looking at some basic things to do with amenities for women on sites. They called it nowhere to go because women had to, there were many stories of women having to find toilets, you know, 20 minutes away from where, where the site was. They just, there were no amenities for women. It boils down to really simple things like that. But what the culture standard is trying to do is actually make a step change and use the government procurement process to, to ask proponents to actually try and address these three interrelated elements, which are gender diversity initiatives, well-being, and particularly mental health initiatives on work sites, but very importantly, working hours. And all our research is telling us that one of the reasons people, young people particularly now, not only women, find the industry a very difficult place to work and they don't even contemplate going into it, or if they do, they leave very quickly, is the, the, the working hours. Now, you know, I just talked earlier about an industry under great stress. It becomes a self-fulfilling problem that people who are expected to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and that is still quite commonplace, uh, are just not in a position to work safely. They're not in a position to feel that this is an attractive industry. They're not feeling work-life balance. It contributes to stress. You know, it is just uh, all the research is saying and all our experience with pilot projects now uh, trying to work five day weeks with 50 hour caps is saying that this is something that actually can shift perceptions of the industry, can shift capacity in the industry, can shift the attractiveness of the industry to young women and, and, and young men as well who, you know, where possible want to work Monday to Friday and, you know, people in the industry used to say, well, that's impossible. We've always worked Saturdays. There are plenty of examples now where five day week and Monday to Friday are being experimented with very successfully. With The unions have been very supportive of this, I might say as well. And there, there, is, um, there, there are ways of, of managing these, um, these pilot projects that we've seen, which is showing that there's no impact on, um, on take home pay for workers and there's productivity dividend. So I think the industry is trying to think differently about this. There are many, many initiatives all over the place, but to look at it as an integrated three domain um, standard that uh, needs to be part of the procurement process is the only way we think that there will be a step change, that the step change that is so necessary to not only address the first year contractors, you know, they're very advanced, they've got resources, they've got HR departments, they actually are in a good position to help us drive change with government in a collaborative way down the supply chain. So second tier, third tier contractors are able to make the, the culture change that is going to sustain the industry. We have a website, cultureandconstruction.com.au, if you're interested <laughs> in having, having a look at it. But it is something we're hoping will be adopted in, in, in government policy based on the research that we're now doing. I think we could keep talking about this issue for some time. I'm sure I'll, we could. I'll, I'll shift on now to the issue of, of technology use in the construction sector and, and whether there are opportunities there to improve productivity and, and thereby reduce our skill shortages, Professor White. I mean, there are, although I think um, absorbing technologies is also, is also a challenge. And um, uh, I was part of the transforming construction agenda um, in the UK. And I think it, it comes back in a way to the conversation we were having about governance structures and how we set projects up. Because, um, you know, for, forward order book um, allows um, contractors to think differently about how to deliver. It, it allows us to start to think about, you know, modular off-site approaches, it allows us to standardise, it allows us to think about um, uh, how we use technologies in delivery. And also I think that if you, want, if you want a digital twin for infrastructure, you really have to procure for that. You have to understand that you're not just building, you know, a railway, for example. You're building a physical railway and a digital railway, and you need to you need to buy that. You can't buy a physical railway and then expect to have the digital information associated with it. You, you, we need to sort of change what we see the sector as delivering, and that needs to be heavily written into. How, how projects are set up, how they're procured, how we think about them. And then I think there's real opportunities to use digital information to clean it up, to start to use project analytics, to start to see ourselves as a, as a high-tech industry 
but that, that really does need to um, start in, in terms of how we start to think about the pipeline and how we start to shape that pipeline. Thanks very much. We can shift now to the issue of materials. Uh, and we've seen obviously a lot of cost escalation and uh, supply chain challenges through, through the pandemic. Uh, so there's a question here about what, I mean, so, so first of all, it would be interesting to hear how that's affecting the industry now, the, the recent development in that, but then in the longer term, what we're doing to build resilience of material prices and availability in the face of climate change and other shocks to, to supply chains. You can start, Don. Yeah, sure. So I think you know, you know, the materials that we use are a combination of you know, Australian materials and overseas materials. And you know, wherever possible, you know, we, we obviously want to use the Australian materials. Now, you know, what, what's the impediments to that? I, I think you know, a certain pipeline is a, is a key issue for materials. Because if, if uh, companies are aware of a pipeline and can bank on that, that pipeline, they'll go and invest. Right, but oftentimes we're seeing projects come to market and particularly going forward when all the projects aren't in metropolitan areas and there's uncertainty on these projects, no one really has time to prepare to invest in the materials. You know, if you want to quarry, if you want a concrete plant, there's long lead times to get you know, environmental approvals, town planning approvals, whatever it may be, to get that up. We can't be thinking about material supply when a contract's awarded because it's too late. Right? And that inevitably is going to add to these, uh, these escalation pressures. So if we can really think ahead, have a certain pipeline that people are able to bank on, get the facilities and the capacity in place, I'm sure that that's going to uh, you know, have a downward effect on escalation because part of the escalation impact is due to demand. Part of the escalation impact is from the, the input pricing that goes into all suppliers as well. You know, power, labour, transport costs, etc. You know, overseas freight costs, everyone's subject to those. But then when you combine that with a heated market, you do get price escalation because you know, people are uh, you know, competing for the somewhat limited resources. Then if we talk about you know, do we use Australian resources, overseas resources, you know, I think we'd all prefer to have overseas resources, sorry, Australian resources. Um, but sometimes they come at a cost. So we've got to be prepared for, for that balance. You know, fabricated steel, you know, we can bring into Australia a lot cheaper than we can do that locally, but that's not what we want to do in Australia. So how do we, how do we get that balance right? How do we work with governments to say, well, okay, we're prepared to pay X amount for, for the local product, get that written into contracts, and that's the way we roll. But then, then you get, well, we go to buy the local product and the capacity is not there because the pipeline hasn't foreseen that the capacity is required. So you, you end up in a do loop. You know, and sometimes you're caught going overseas uh, just to get supply certainty. So you know, that would be my key message, you know, to get certainty in pipelines so people, companies, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of supply, suppliers and vendors out there whose that's their lifeblood to supply the construction industry. They need certainty to invest and train people as well. That's a good point. Can I just um, raise a, a, a small addendum to that um, uh, and plug the uh, market capacity report that I did at the same time? But there is a great opportunity in roads construction uh, to use recycled materials. I think um, the current estimates are something like $76 billion worth of materials forecasted for use in road construction. Uh, and at least 27% of that can actually be recycled, be used, materials can be recycled. Um, you know, the Major Road Project Victoria have done a wonderful job um, looking at that very carefully and there's a business called Ecologic that is specialising in that and really making some great strides. I mean, it's win-win everywhere because of course it reduces emissions, um, it creates a more sustainable industry, but it helps address that, um, that supply chain issue with, uh, with products. So, um, uh, again, um, uh, it makes our um, uh, market capacity report another good read. So um, have a look at that because it is a real opportunity for us. So bringing in that circular economy into, Indeed. into the, con yeah, the construction industry. Yeah. Great. And 
guess following on from the cost escalation in, in materials and also the consequence of fixed term contracting has meant we've seen an increase in insolvencies in, in the sector. Is that something you're concerned about in terms of the increasing market concentration in, in infrastructure industries? Yeah, it's been it's been awful, hasn't it, to see um, to see uh, companies, local companies, go to go to the wall. I think with the major infrastructure projects, they're so complex, and you'd know this better than anyone, Don. The the complexity and the depth and the scale of them. Um, naturally, you're going to need global experience and specialist skills. Uh, and uh, so the tier one contractors are uh, inevitably where, um, where the primary uh, focus is going, to, is going to be. But let's not forget that the tier one contractors you know, have a large supply chain of tier two, three and specialist contractors that they, that they use. Um, so there is a great, a great capacity to continue to grow tier two and three contractors. And I know major um, transport infrastructure uh, in here in Victoria has done a lot of thinking about how you break packages up into smaller digestible uh, pieces so local contractors can, uh, and, and the risk is allocated in, in ways that don't, don't rely necessarily on such a big balance sheet as you need for a major infrastructure project, which is one of the factors, of course, that leads to tier one international contractors being the, um, being the leads. But there is a real opportunity, and it is happening, where tier two and three contractors are beginning to enter the market in their own right, in the right uh, proportionality to their expertise. Uh, but um, it, you know, it, it, is a, it is a growth area. Uh, but we do need to think about risk allocation. That is a really big issue here. And I think um, the rise of more collaborative contracting, the various typologies, is, is assisting that as, as well. But um, inevitably, tier one contractors are the ones uh, who have the expertise for the you know multi-billion dollar uh, tunnelling projects and the very very complicated energy projects, telecoms projects, and um, we rely on, on 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 those contractors for the for the very obvious reason. John, have you got anything to? Look, I I, I, I think there's a, a very simple way that we can you know get more tier and tier two and tier three involvement, and and you know, most of the joint ventures we go into. You know, governments require a joint and several liability for those uh, for those joint ventures. We recently went to uh, to, to one jurisdiction and said, "Look, we, we want to work with you know, what was in itself a joint venture of some tier threes, but they can't do a joint and several. They'll they'll be responsible for their share of the JV, but not ours. We'll, we'll warrant their share, but they can't warrant our share." And government was wrapped. They said, "Yep, we, we can deal with that." And that's that's brought on some tier threes into a you know, five hundred million dollar job. So yeah, we we really advocate that. We, we'd like to see more of that happening. It opens up capacity. There's some uh, you know some terribly good technical expertise that it resides in tier two, tier three contractors. All the construction tasks inevitably are pretty similar. It's just the scale that uh, that needs to be managed a lot of the time. There's a a question here picking up on a point you raised earlier, Gabrielle, about the, the mental health issues within the, the workforce. Of course, that's work that where my colleague Cassandra Windsor has done some, some work for, for CEDA. Um, I guess perspectives and, and perhaps even from a, from a um, project management perspective, what can be done to improve the mental health of the workforce in construction? So what? Um, shall I start and then... Um, Please, kick off. I mean... I mean uh, uh, mental health um, is such a big in issue in our industry, and you know I, I think um, uh, it is it is it is it's really bound up in that set of reforms that you were talking about in terms of the cultural shift of the industry. Because I think if we can improve mental health, if we can improve work work life balance then we also attract other people into the industry. Um, what, what we were doing in the UK was, was, was really looking at that off-site opportunity to allow people to, um, to, to live more locally. Because I think, the, the fl and, and Australia has a really big problem with the fly-out kind of culture, because, because there you've got the challenge of people being away from their networks, away from their support networks, you know, living on a construction site, 
Um, you know, and, and so the more that you can take the work into environments where people can stay with their support networks, the better, really, for mental health. And so, you know, it, it's an area that, that, that has been a lot of work in, I know, in Australia, um, also in the UK, in trying to put in mental health first aiders, trying to really um, address that issue in our sector. And I think, you know, it, it, it's often the um, it's often safety that gets the headlines around people who have fatalities or life-changing injury, injuries at work. Um, but certainly in the UK, um, mental health and suicide was actually a bigger factor than the, the the safety on site. And so, safety on site, of course, is extremely important. But it's also important that we look at the well-being of our workforce in a longer-term way. Gabrielle. Just on that point, the local, the local statistic that always gives me an extraordinarily sharp intake of breath is that here in Australia, if you're a construction worker, you're six times more likely to die of suicide than you are of a workplace accident. And that's your point exactly, Jennifer, that, um, and someone put it to me this way, we shout safety but we whisper health, particularly mental health. It's an area where we really do need to work, uh, work much harder. And that is one of the integral elements that I was talking about earlier um, in the culture standard. We, we have to think much, much more carefully about what we provide to our workers in terms of their well-being, physical health as well as, as, well as mental health, but, um, but particularly mental health. There's been a lot of great work that's been done um, so far, but the stress that the industry is under, the working hours, all these things are uh, interlocked. Uh, and, and indeed, I think diversity too, because um, I think there's plenty of research that, uh, that suggests that the presence of women, more women <coughs> and more diverse people in, in, in um, workplaces actually moderates behaviours and, and, and actually produces a more con conducive environment for people in which to, to work where the, the stress levels can be, can be moderated. So it is a really big challenge and that's one of the things that the culture standard focuses on. And, um, I think um, procurement is, is a possible solution to making sure that we can get a really good focus on mental health and culture more generally, including diversity and working hours uh, uh, as a requirement in, the, um, in, the, in, in, in big projects. It, it's an industry that's full of targets. You know? I mean, I, I don't know a client who doesn't want their job delivered sooner than is reasonable. Um, so, yeah, you, you up against it from the start, program-wise, overlain by you know, keeping people safe on job, the commercial relationships that exist up the line, down the line. Um, you know, more, a, a lot of jobs now we're seeing, um, you know, as we move from sort of greenfield to brownfield jobs in cities, you know, it's not just a nine to five, not that it ever was, but a, a daytime job. You know, it's increasingly rail possessions, road possessions, out of hours, weekends, whatever, that are putting those demands on people and they're unavoidable you know, to avoid disrupting the community. So you put all that together and you know, th there, there is a lot to work through. We have to come up with solutions. We are. I think you know, the, the flexibility approach you know, and just different contracts forms that aim to take away you know, some of the, the commercial tensions are part of the solution as well. And I mean, the other one, you know, I'll go back to training again because as I said earlier, you know, the way projects are set up now, you've got to have a core of competency and you surround the new player, you know, put the new people around that core. That puts extra pressure on that core. You know? So training's part of this as well. That's right. And just, to, just, sorry, just one more comment. I think um, naturally a lot of projects are uh, given timelines that coincidentally um, uh, occur uh, around elections. And uh, I think, uh, you know, politicians have to think a lot more carefully now about what that means for the people working on these projects. And uh, that's why the culture standard has been a collaboration. The clients absolutely need to be at the table to understand that absurd time timelines are just going to be so counterproductive and so potentially damaging to so many people, even though the industry has responded incredibly. I mean, the, the work that this industry does, the miracles of engineering, the amazing projects that are across our cities, I really don't know, frankly, sometimes how the industry has delivered what it has, given the stress that it's, 
that it's under, we've got to relieve that stress. Governments have to be at the table. Uh, we all have to be at the table thinking about this because um, it is just unsustainable, isn't it? So we've dealt with a lot of challenges. I want to finish on a positive note. What is it that you see as the greatest opportunity to improve the market capacity of the infrastructure sector? Start with you, Don. Uh, it's pipeline certainty and training. I uh, agree with those. Um, I think obviously the focus on culture and hopefully through something like the culture standard uh, and I think um, contracting, contracting typologies, much more collaborative contracts is going to make a huge difference too. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Don and Gabrielle have said. I think this sort of mindset shift and organ, organize, or the, the way that we organise the sector really has to change. So there's some structural um, uh, changes around, uh, and cultural changes really, about how we, how we collaborate in the sector. That's not going to address our, um, our immediate challenges with skill gaps on, on, the, on, 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 on site, but I think it really does need to happen longer term to get the right kind of skills in place for the sector that we need to be. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to break for coffee now before we come back and get a Canadian uh, perspective on infrastructure performance, getting better infrastructure performance. But, but I'd like to first say thank you very much for the audience participation through the great questions. Uh, and I'd like you to join me in thanking Jennifer, Gabrielle and, and Don for the panel today. Thank you.